today on the academic and behavioral outcomes for kids. I've got some ongoing work looking at crime outcomes as well. I was hoping to get those some, get a couple of slides and then I wasn't able to finish up what I wanted to, to properly represent it. But what I want to do first is talk a little bit about um, what school closures look like both in Philadelphia and more broadly as a policy tool in predominantly urban districts, focus on the Philadelphia context, talk through the data and, and empirical design to estimate the effect of these closures on both kids that were displaced due to the school closings as well as kids um, in schools that received those students in the year following their schools being closed. And then just, I understand this, this is an econ uh, talk, but maybe spend a few minutes just talking about sort of the broader policy implications of, of this work. Wait, we care about policy. Eric, I, I know, I know. In fact, we were just talking about this, right? Let's, you know, we find the effect, what does this mean for policy? Okay. So more broadly, right, for those who are unfamiliar, and again, I'm not assuming any level of familiarity here, so if it's a little droll, I'll move a little bit more quickly in the empirical work, but as some may know, districts across the U.S. have increasingly relied on closing schools for reasons related to um, persistent under-enrollment, which is often, particularly in urban settings, a function of increasing charter school enrollment. The schools are being targeted for closures of these schools, that are typically significantly underperforming relative to district and certainly state averages. There are two big federal policies that have sort of moved the momentum forward around school closings. The first happened in 2001 going forward from uh, the No Child Left Behind Act and more recently Obama, the Obama administration's school turnaround initiatives which really have prompted many of the largest districts to endorse school closings at least in principle as a means of offering students better educational options. Between 2000 and 2010, the period over which NCLB and the Obama administration turned on initiatives really took hold, 70 urban districts nationwide closed on average 11 traditional public schools, right? More, um, an example in Chicago, which happened at the same time as Philadelphia, Chicago closed 49 of its schools in 1213. There's a recent conversation in Chicago about closing additional schools. And this number is pretty big, but I'll tell you as a share of traditional public schools in Chicago, it's actually a smaller fraction of the share that we closed, that, we, that Philadelphia closed in 2011-12, right? So a lot of schools um, are being closed, and the question, of course, is what's the effect? And more broadly, right, this has been a controversial policy. There's evidence on the adverse effect of student mobility on students' outcomes that are particularly concentrated among kids who are minority and disadvantaged and economically. There's some associational evidence showing the relationship between mobility and adverse behavioral outcomes, absences, and misconduct. Two outcomes I'll focus on today, absences and suspensions as a, as a proxy for misconduct. Certainly parents have, been, have voiced concern about the extent to which these closings are going to force kids to travel sort of unfriendly boundaries. I'll talk a little bit about the extent to which distance travel following closures, closures moderated the effect, if at all, on achievement and, and uh, behavioral outcomes. So that's a one question for you. Yeah. Um, so the, the first two bullets, so a little bit, little bit apples and oranges there in the sense that what those guys are talking about is mobility in the sense of your parents pick you up and move you to a brand new place. Any mobility. mobility. Any mobility. Whereas a school closer, right. typically you move you and your friends. So it's unclear if the, the negative effects are are right. theoretically as compelling. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I mean, I think you've got sort of any mobility due to resi either residential mobility or school choice related mobility, whereas we're talking here about sort of policy induced mobility as a function of closeness. That's right. But again, I think what your point brings out, Eric, is that there is relatively limited evidence. I'll talk a little bit about Absolutely. this around sort of what we know about the. Eric's question did not make me heated at all. It's just, <laughs> I've got multiple layers on, so well, I'm going to take this off. Um, but yeah, so there's really limited evidence that we're trying to sort of fill the gap, at least around urban closure. That's right. Now, certainly the justification, particularly from a policy perspective and made by policymakers, is that these displaced students are going to benefit from potentially better academic opportunities following closings. And I'll provide some descriptive evidence in terms of what were the school climates that these students entered following school closings, and then ultimately 
did these things actually generate any meaningful improvements in their academic and non-academic outcomes? And of course, there's a concern, as you said, Eric, is that students are leaving schools due to policy, but they're entering new schools. And the question is, to what extent do district level policies that induce student mobility generate some negative spillovers onto students in, on average, higher performing schools? So it's always the bad schools close? So it's not always, right? So this is a good question. So typically there's this distinction between targeted and non-targeted closures. So targeted closings in urban districts, we're really talking about identifying the lowest performing schools. And by that, we typically mean schools yeah. serving the lowest achieving kids, right? We're not really, typically the, the, the selection criteria is not on value added, school value added, it's really on school proficiency. But there are, there's evidence from other school closings, like in Michigan, Quentin Grubbin has a paper in JPUB E from a couple years ago, and there's a paper by Ron Zimmer and colleagues in Journal of Urban Ed from about five years ago that looked at an anonymous Northeast district, okay. Pittsburgh. But there, the average performance or average quality of the schools that closed looked no different on, right, than the schools that remained open. Here, you're gonna look at, we're going to see very different kids, even in a district like Philadelphia that's relatively academically and economically disadvantaged, that were displaced due to the closing. So targeted versus sort of, you know, some other sort of motivation for closing schools. Yeah. What about costs? Yeah, that's a good question. Doesn't seem to be a factor in your. It's not in that I don't have school building level finance data. So the finance data that's available from the F33 and the, and the National Center for Education Statistics is at the district level. So yes, that is a motive. That is a justification in part. That we're going to save on all these fixed costs of keeping a building open with 500 student uh, capacity, but only 150 students enrolled. That's certainly justification. We're going to generate proceeds from selling these closed buildings. Yeah, I mean, there's no. Could we back out to some extent the cost savings on a per pupil basis before and after? We could try, but I think. And that could have a. Positive, like I don't know where the yeah. money is going, right. so, but it could be a source of a positive effect on remaining schools. It could be if they're investing more in resources it's, in those schools. Mm -hmm. And then there's also this question of, and I don't have teacher level data, or I didn't have it for this paper, I actually just got statewide teacher level data, so I'm hoping to try to build on this work, in following where these teachers go. Right? Mm -hmm. So are we actually, you know, does student teacher ratios change at the school level, which again we don't have at the school level, we have it at the district level at least with the um, sort of federally, federal data. Um, but once, now that I've got this sort of micro data for teachers, are more or less effective teachers moving, right? And you can almost see that as, a, as an efficiency enhancing policy, right? Where we're actually, by virtue of closing schools, cutting off from the left side of the sort of teacher effectiveness distribution and keeping some of these more effective teachers, but just reshuffling them across schools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are all important questions. So again, what do we know before, already? There's, so there's some mixed evidence in terms of the academic effects, the direct effect on kids displaced due to closings. There's some evidence from, again, from Engberg. This is the Pittsburgh closings, Bromit statewide in Michigan, of a negative effect on math and ELA achievement. There's evidence of a positive effect looking across the eight largest or eight urban districts in Ohio from uh, Devin Carlson and Stephen Levertu's work. Um, and then some evidence from Chicago saying no effect from the round of closures that happened about 2006 or so. There's also some limited evidence on the non-academic or behavioral effects. Engberg and all find some increases in absences for those kids displaced due to closures the year after. There's also mixed evidence on these spillovers. In this Pittsburgh setting, this anonymous Northeastern district, no achievement or attendance effects on receiving school students. And again, receiving school students are those students who are in schools that received displaced students the year after closings. And then there's some evidence from statewide closings in, in Michigan of a negative spillover effect. What, what's the volume in these other contexts? Like how many these receiving schools? Like what, you know, the change in enrollment or yeah. the share? So it varies. And then, and from it shows, and I'll also show this as well, that the negative spillover effect is increasing in the, sh in the concentration yeah. of the share okay. of displaced kids who enroll post-closure. But I don't remember offhand, Sean, and I can find this out for you, sort of what the distribution looks like. And I'll show you the distribution in Philadelphia. It actually varies quite widely. Okay. Yeah. But there's the second piece that you mentioned was more of where I was going with it. It's that it varies as a function of, exactly, right? Um, and it'll make, I think it makes more sense in context where 
Um, again, the targeted nature of the closures is such that you're shifting the lowest achieving kids with sort of the worst behavioral uh, measures to these schools, which on average look better. And then there's this important heterogeneity with respect to um, am I attending a school that's better? Right? And again, as a preview, we do find that in Philadelphia as well. If I go to a better school, on average I'm doing better. Right? Now we can't say it's a result of the better school because the heterogeneity is not causal, but um, it certainly suggests that on average um, that's an important feature of, of targeted school closures. So the Philadelphia context. So Philadelphia in 2011 12 had two major rounds of closures. Really the major round was in 12 13. And what I'm going to talk about today is three questions. First, descriptively, which I know just rings in the ears of the economists, right? Did displaced students enroll in higher performing schools post closure? Again, this is important to get a sense for um, what's the sort of compositional changes that we might observe post closure, right? Again, if, we, if we're in settings where on average the students look no different than the school, in schools that close, than schools that receive them, then we wouldn't necessarily expect to see um, spillover effects, right? If we're mixing kids that on average look similar. But that's not the case in Philadelphia, and we'll see that the students in Philadelphia, their schools, um, their own achievement, their own behavioral measures were what, much worse than the kids um, in schools that didn't close. And then more directly, what's the effect of closing these schools on the academic achievement of students displaced as well as their receiving school peers and the years following closure, and then on the behavioral dimension, so in terms of attendance, both excused and unexcused absences, and then also suspension days. So a bit of background on what happened in Philadelphia. There was a plan that was set in place in 2010 which really identified schools eligible for closure based in principle on infrastructure costs and academic performance. Where infrastructure costs is really, what's the fixed cost of keeping these schools open when the enrollment is a quarter of the capacity that the school can take, right? So in 2011-12, 10 schools were recommended for closure of which six closed. Four elementary and middle schools serving grades K through eight. Those are the schools that I'm going to focus on and the students that I'm going to focus on because I've got achievement data for those third through eighth grade students. And then in the subsequent year, this is our major round of school closings, where 24 schools closed. Um, and I'm going to focus on these 16 elementary and middle school um, kids in those schools where again, where I have achievement data. So this is Philadelphia. Folks, been to Philadelphia? It's a fairly decent city. It's not New York, but it's all right. Um, and so what you'll notice, so this is Center City, for those who are familiar with Philadelphia. This is West Philly, right? Um, Sean grew up somewhere over here, right? That's right. I. Okay. And what you'll see, the red dots are those schools closed at the end of the 12-13 year, and the green dots are the schools closed in 11-12. The blue dots are schools that remain open. And for those who are familiar with Philadelphia, this is North Philly. This is South East Philly, Southwest Philly. This is almost entirely black and Hispanic and poor. Right? There's a zip code in North Philly that is the second poor zip code behind a zip code in, in Mississippi. So we're talking about high poverty levels in these neighborhoods. Um, and what you'll also notice right, is there's quite a bit of density of schools. Right? And so what I'll show is in terms of looking at the change in distance travel, students are not traveling particularly far or further additionally far to their schools um, following closings, given that there is quite a sort of rich concentration or density of schools um, around the schools that close. Okay. And what I don't have in here is charter data, so I'll be very upfront about that. There's no charter data in here, so I'm not, I can't observe kids that actually exited the school, um, but I will tell you that the exit rates to charter schools are quite low. So in 13-14 and 12-13, the year after these two rounds of closures, between 2 and 3% of kids displaced ended up in charters. You might say that sounds so much so low, but keep in mind that the charter sector in Philadelphia is, is a fairly robust one. At this time, around 11, 12, 12, 13, about a third of the 200,000 public school kids in Philadelphia were already in charter schools. So you might think the kids whose families would have selected into charters would have done so already. And in fact, in Chicago, in 13, 14, following, following their major round of closures, about 3 or 4% of kids ended up in charters. So it's, it's very consistent with, with what's been found in other districts. Okay, so the first question is, what do these schools look like? At least on observable. So this top trend from the 0506 to the 1213 year is the open schools. So schools that remained open during this period and throughout the post period, where the post period would really just be after this year, except for these three or four schools that closed in 1112. And this is our bottom trend is these, these schools that closed. And 
what you'll see is that both in terms of math and ELA proficiency, right, the schools, while different, trend very similarly, right, which is good at least as a first approximation for the definitive design, and I'll show you the student level trends in a few minutes as well. But again, the first takeaway is these closed schools over this period are performing about 40% of their kids are proficient in math and about 40 or 35% in ELA, right? About 50% in these schools that remained open. So we're not talking about high performing schools, right? The district is, is a particularly low performing district in terms of the students that are being served. Um, but I think at least as a first approximation, we see similar trends in terms of these school level outcomes. And we see that also, except for this little blip in suspensions here. Here we've got per capita suspensions on the y-axis. This is just the number of suspensions per student. So, right, so 0.5 would be 50 suspensions per 100 students. And again, here are the schools that close. And there's a little bit of an uptick here, but at least in the three years before closure, they're trending pretty similarly. And then truancy rates, right? So this is just from zero to one, right? Certainly there are more truant, the, the rate of truancy is higher in these schools that close, but they also trend pretty similarly. Right. So in levels, they're, they're different, but at least in terms of the pre-closure trends, they look pretty similar. So I'm going to use student-level data to get at these, um, these questions about achievement and behavioral outcomes, and relying again on the grade 3 through 8 students who I have test score data for in the traditional public schools. I'm looking at the 10, 11 through 15, 16 school years. So again, 11, 12, and 12, 13, those are the key closure years. So yes, I don't have much pre-data. It's the, it's the, you know, working with Philadelphia is enough to just get this data. Demographics, so we've got the sort of standard demographics on kids, age, race, ethnicity, and gender. So, Wait, have, so you've got, you've got one, potentially two pre-years, right? You've so got three pre-closure years. So you've got, so for 12, 13, oh, you've got 12, 10, 11. The first year? Well, 11, 12 was the first year, but we're only talking about, I'll show you about 400 kids out of the four or 5,000 okay. that closed. So it's a minority of the kids. In terms of the, but yes, for 12 13, I'll have 12 13 is the year of closure, so I'll have that year 11 12 and 10 11. So two. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So I've got attendance record, so I know the number of days out of the full school year, which is about 180 in Philadelphia, of school days enrolled, um, and then the number of days absent, both again, excused and unexcused, and then the number of out of school suspension days, um, and I'm going to again sort of normalize these as a function of um, days enrolled. And I'll standardize the math and ELA scores within sample at the subject grade level. And then I also have home and school addresses, which is going to allow me to measure distance traveled in the year of closure to a student's school, and then the year after closure to try to, to calculate these change in distance measures. So again, just this is a lot on the table, so I'm going to focus on this first, the second cohort. So again, this 11-12 cohort, we're talking about 499 grade 3 through 8 kids that are in one of these four elementary and middle schools that closed, right? And then we've got 3,300 in the second cohort, which is why I'm just going to focus on these, and everything sort of is sort of the same in terms of the general pattern. So the first pattern, right, is that kids in these closed schools, 94% of them are black or Hispanic, right? In a district where 75% are black or Hispanic, compared to schools that received any of these kids in the following year, right, where you've got 70% and then compared to these non-receiving schools, right, 52%, right? So I'm going to use as a comparison the trends in these kids that attended the non-receiving school, and I'm going to show you, at least at the student level, that while the levels are quite different, the trends look very, very similar. So take it, those, those last couple columns, that's really just due to geography, okay. it, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. that's the right. rich live in different parts of the city, and be right. too far above the And the rich is, you know, very, very mm -hmm. lowercase r in Philadelphia. Is that yeah. all the Northeast? This is more or less the far northeast, okay. yeah. right? Which is predominantly. It looks like a suburb. In certain yeah. So this is so. So as you saw in this sort of map here, this is the far northeast, which yeah. has a huge Russian um, immigrant population um, and other sort of white European immigrants in that community. Yeah. So demographically, they're very different in terms of poverty. Again, in a district which is about three quarters poor in terms of free or reduced price lunch. 82% are in these schools that close compared to these schools that are relatively more advantaged. Again, this is not an advantage of kids, right? 75% for years plus lunch. Okay. So what about the achievement of these kids in the year of closure? To try to get a sense for descriptively, <coughs> are the schools that they ended up in after closings, do they look different? And the answer is yes. So this dark bar here are the grade 3 through 8 students. This is their math Z score, right? From 
standardized 0, 1. The middle is the group of schools that received at least one kid following closings. And then here are the kids that didn't receive any. And the clear pattern, right, is these kids are entering schools that are significantly higher performing, or at least in terms of their student achievement, than the schools that they left, right, on average. Um, but again, the, the non-receiving schools do look different. These are, these are normalized at the city level, not at the state That's at the district level. Yeah. Okay. That's right. So, yeah, so, so exactly, standardized within sample, district, okay. district mean standard deviation. Yeah. So uh, the decision about which schools would receive and which wouldn't receive that's Good question. So there were, so for each school that was closed, the district said, we're going to give you one or two reassignment options. Chicago calls them welcoming schools, so they call them this. But the kids are not mandated to go to those schools, right? To the extent that the school isn't a magnet school or isn't a selective enrollment school, of which there are, I think, none in the elementary grades in Philadelphia. And to the extent that the schools are under-enrolled, students can go more or less wherever they want. Right, and there's also a lot of mobility here, right? So you also have a lot of residential mobility, um, which will be, you know, you know, again, the, the, if you think about the effect of closings, right? Not only do we think about the effect of closing the schools, but also the residential decisions that families might make as a function of the, the school closures. But you're right, the schools that they end up in, on average, these kids are traveling less than half a mile to their more to their new school following closings, given the density as we saw of all these open schools. Yeah. But they weren't, but it wasn't, and you know, if they had been, and if we thought about using this as even as like an instrument, you know, the school that they, they were assigned to, but there's about 30% of the kids ended up in schools that they were said, these are your reassignment options. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is just telling the same story on the proficiency dimension. Again, about a quarter of the students in schools that were closed in the year of closure were proficient, compared to about 40% in schools that welcomed them, following closures, and again, the schools that didn't receive them were certainly much higher performing in terms of their student achievement. And we also see much higher suspension rates in the schools that closed compared to the schools that received them. Twenty percent of students ever received an out-of-school suspension in the year of closure compared to 13 percent among schools that received them and a much lower rate of 8 percent in the non-receiving schools. So again, the behavioral characteristics look very different. This is the count of, or days of suspension. So about 81 days per 100 students of uh, suspension in the year of closure among those closed schools. Again, the rate is about half that in these, in these other schools that receive, that receive them. Absence is the same story. I'll just jump to the, um, the, the count in terms of days. So in terms of all absences in the year of closure, about 13. Right? And again, you're thinking about a school year that's 180 days. Right? So on average, kids in schools that were closed missed 13 days, most of which were for unexcused reasons. Right? And for, we know from the literature there's quite a bit of an adverse outcomes for kids associated with unexcused absence. So these kids' behavioral profiles, in addition to their academic profiles in the year of closure, look very different and much worse in the schools that they ultimately enrolled in. All right? That's the basic picture here. Yes. Yes, yeah, sir. When was the announcement of the Good school question. Year? Good question. Yeah. And so the announcement happened in March of the school year. Of the of the school year that I sent in. That exactly. So March 2013, for example, in the 12-13 round, there was after a bunch of negotiations, right? Which schools would close, which wouldn't. That was the announcement date, and there was one or two schools where the announcement date was like around April, early April. The test is about mid or late April. The state test. Right, and I'll show you. Um, I'm going to show you estimates of the effect on test scores in the year of closure. Because one concern, of course, I think, is you're sort of bringing up, if not explicitly, I think it's sort of what, what sort of underlies your question is: Could there have been some sort of adverse sort of outcomes for kids in the year of closure, some sort of dip, if you will, an Ashton Helter type dip in the year of closure? And I'm going to estimate that directly. There's some, there's some evidence that, on average, the the, the um, like behavioral outcomes are worse in the year of closure. There's no significant evidence in terms of achievement, which some have found that there had been sort of adverse achievement effects in the year prior to closure, but the trends um, give me some more confidence that you know, we can see some average differences relative to the year of closure, but the trends pre-closure are also lower. Well, on a similar note, um, was the uncertainty about which schools were gonna be closed or whether they're gonna be closed or at all, um, because I also, you know, I mean, 
If this has been debated, you said that there were negotiations, yes, right? Yes, yes. This probably has been in the local news, Absolutely. in the newspapers, yes. going over for a month, yeah. not a year. Right? Yeah, no, this is a great question. So beginning in the fall of the 2012 year, for example, the 2012-13 year, um, around December, January, 39 schools were announced as identified for school closing, of which, again, 24 ultimately closed. And so there was, in Philadelphia, there was a, there's a school reform commission, which is effectively our school board. It's no longer as of this year. They're responsible for voting on which schools recommended by the district would close. And to your point, there was quite a bit of negotiation over those three or more, four months period. So there was also uncertainty sort of about which schools would close. Right, so students didn't know in December or January that their school would close. They knew more closer to the end they of March. They were in the waiting list. Exactly, exactly, yeah. yeah. But sorry, I missed, yeah. you might have said this. So did you look also one year back yes. just to avoid this? Absolutely. And then they're still underperforming they still un compared to... Yeah, they're definitely underperforming, but in terms of the effect, the pre-closure effect of closures, at least on achievement, statistically, there's no effect. And I'll show you those those estimates. But on yeah. the sort of you know you're comparing all these student behavior yeah. stuff. So those, if you compare the year before, it's still worse than the receiving school. That's right. That's right. And I'll show you those those estimates. Yeah, because again, that's yeah yeah. Let me hold off on that. Yeah. Do you have any idea what's happening to the teachers in the that's years leading up to this? Yeah. We're, yeah. That's a great question. I don't have teacher level data, or I just got teacher level data from the state, not from the district. Okay. So I don't have a good I don't have a sense yet, at least from this, this Philadelphia administrative data, where the teachers are going. Okay. Right? Um, you know, one question of course is, is follow up work is did more effective teachers remain in the district? Do they were they sorted to different schools? Yeah. What happened to the least effective teachers in those schools that received Right. Students that close, there's certainly as well as teachers that whose jobs were displaced due to the closings. Right, because you can see if sort of it's, if they're in negotiation, the words out, you can see the first thing is the best teacher is leaving. Right. Um, I don't know, maybe not. But that's it might, right. I mean, you can, you can see it two ways, right? right? So, like, the best teachers might stay because they've got tenure. Right. And, and, and they're okay. guaranteed yeah. a position in somewhere. Ah, uh, gotcha. Right? Yeah. Um, but again, that's, yeah, or to your point, the best teachers might say, look, I've put in all this work in these really lower performing schools. Yeah. You know, it's time for me to just go to the, the neighboring district. Yeah. Yeah. But again, it's an empirical question, which I, now that I've got this teacher level data, I can try to sort out. Yeah. Thank you. Sean, just keep me talking, just let me know. Sure. Yeah. So let me just get right to this some more uh, <coughs> causal, if you will, story to look at the effect on student achievement and behavioral outcomes in the post-closure years. We need a difference in different strategy, estimating it semi-parametrically, looking at both the sort of pre-closure effects as well as the post-closure effects, to try to get some sense of to what extent might this potential option filter dip, this dip in achievement or outlaw behavioral outcomes in the year of the announcement of closings be of be concern for the identification. I'm gonna estimate effects both for displaced and receiving school students. So again, kids that were displaced through the closings and students that received at least one displaced student in the year after closure. And again, to Sean's point, looking at the important heterogeneity that results as a function of, did I take in one kid or did I take in hundreds of kids? Right. So first, the, again, the concentration of displaced students in receiving schools, looking at the change in school performance. So on average, was uh, my achievement or behavioral outcomes moderated by the change in the performance of the school that I entered? compared to the school that I exited due to closing, and then to what extent might some additional travel costs, as measured by distance travel, moderate these effects. So, I'm going to, so let's start with this sort of specification here where we've got a student outcome, right, Y. Close is going to indicate whether that student attended a school that closed J years from the year of closure, right? So for example, close T equals 11, 12, if my school closed at the 12, 13 year, right, J is negative one, is just an indicator equal to one. Right, so again, it's just gonna allow me to non-parametrically map the pre and post closure effects here. That's gonna be those gamma J coefficients on, the, on that closed indicator. I've got a vector of time varying student X's, age, race, gender, and then sort of various status in terms of free reduced lunch, special ed, English language learner status, Right, I've got student fixed effects, and again, the comparison groups are sort of baked into this 
grade by year fixed effect here, right? So this is gonna be any kid that didn't come from a closed school, right? At that grade by year level. And what, yep, sorry. what time, so um, are they gonna be assigned zero then, which is kind of implicitly putting them in event year zero? So, or so the event is going to be relative to T. So yeah. again, if your school closed in 1213. No, 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 we must know about the control group. Oh, with the control group. Okay. okay. So the control group right now, this is I'm gonna to get to this the, the question okay. I think you're getting at, which is what about all those kids that receive kids from closed schools? Oh, that's not the question you're getting. So at. so so the, the, the kids who are in schools that do close are yep. in progression. Yes. Um but you're not assigning them a donkey. No. Oh, right. So they're just getting a zero. That's correct. That's correct. So that's implicitly gonna Put them into the excluded dump. That's exactly right. Okay. Okay. Yep. Okay. So right. So like right. So these are. So these are just different people do that different ways. Yeah. yeah. This. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So yeah. So this is a, just a dummy for a series of like columns in the yeah. matrix, right? Which yeah. is, you know, t t minus one, t minus two, t t t plus one, t plus two, which is just zero one, and you get a one depending on the year from closure if you were in a closed school. But the question I thought you were going to ask, and that's yeah. Yeah, which is. Even when you're taking course, what about all the kids that ended up in schools with these closed kids, right? Because again, the yeah. these coefficients are going to pick up on the any effect on the kids that were from closed schools, as well as any changes in outcomes for kids that may have received those kids, right? So we're going to address that potential crossover problem here by putting in this indicator for whether a student was in a school that actually received a displaced student, right? So to be more specific about this. If a student attended a school that received at least one displaced student in 12-13-14 from a school that closed in 12-13, right, then their dummy variable in that year, k equals 1, right, will be 1. Jay, I mean, yeah. this seems like a particular case where you ought to just have a continuous treatment. Instead of receiving IS, you should have share received IS. I'm still concerned about receiving and share received in the sense that their 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 uh, choice variables. Right. Right. So these things themselves, uh, uh, you know, are the observables of school districts say I'll take in fifty. There are right. different observables yeah. that take, say I'll take in two. Right. Um, so, so, but nevertheless, yeah. no, 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 no. This seems like be very heterogeneous by the shape. And, and so you've crudely taken it as a dummy. Right. So, so once treated the same as a thousand. To get the, right. So I'm mean, to get the main the average effect, and then I'm going to parse that average effect as a function of the concentration of displaced students as you identify. That's right. That's right. But this allows me to at least separate just the mean effect, right? If you believe the strategy. Yeah, no, 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 no. Does it? Yeah. So this. Is in the sense mean? that, um, again, you know, if you close, 100% yeah. of your students left. That's right. If you're receiving, you could have got one student. That's right. That's so right. how does that back out then the average, the rel average relative to two? So the beta k is just going to be the average effect, right, on a kid. Of, a, ah, of yes. anyone who's. That's right. Yeah. Of a kid, yeah. at the kid yeah. level. Yeah. Right, yeah. So at, right. So at the kid level, right, as opposed yeah. to the school level. level. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Right, and then, right. Then what I'll do, Eric, is just say, let's add some dimensionality, as you suggested, to this receiving <laughs> indicator, which is the fraction of kids following closure that attended that school. Sorry, one thirty minutes. Yeah, please. Um, this is if if the school receive any student or if my grade receive a student. Good question. School. So it could not even be my grade. Right? That's right. That's right. Okay. So I'm just focused at the at the school level here. Yeah. 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 Okay. So again, so so here the comparison group is going to be students who did not attend a receiving school in the year in which students were received. All right. Now, what do you do about all those schools that are just out there and following them? What do I do about them? Are, you, are they in your control group? Yeah. And they're, they're going to look very different on levels, right? But, what, but here are the trends on these student level outcomes, right? So yes, these are the schools, Eric, that never, the kids in schools that never saw displaced kids, right? This is the trend, and again, this is the 12-13 this the year, this is the 13-14 year. So here I'm just looking at the, the biggest cohort of 12, 13 closures. I guess what I'm asking yeah. is you have this beautiful, you have this potentially nice little thing that the, the district, you know, still have this like quasi built in RD. Yeah. In the sense that you have a window, in the sense that the district identified 
32, 64, whatever the number was, right. the schools, right. they only closed about half of those. That's right. About th yeah, about two thirds. Yeah. So you kind of have this, like, you know, you've got your, your RV window where you can just slice it with, here are schools that are, you know, the district considered observably equivalent. Mm -hmm. But some got treated, some didn't. I mean. Yeah. So, so this is, I'm still working on this part, which is, you could do the same analysis if you restrict the comparison group to just those kids that's who identified I mean. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I haven't gotten, to, yeah. I, I'm not going to show you that, but that's something I'm still okay. working on. But there could yeah. have been a reason why they decided not to close those particular ones. So I don't know if it's But that's probably less concern than why they chose the ones they did. I, mean, I feel a little bit more comfortable with a set of schools that were all at least identified with, with comparing, a set of schools were all identified yeah. for closing, mm -hmm. than comparing a set oh, of schools that yeah. were closed to a set of schools that were never ever considered to be closed. Right? That's, that's my mm -hmm. concern. Okay, let's see. Yeah, no, I think that's a fair point. Again, something we're still, we're still working on. But let me just show you, yeah, the, sorry, just a technical. Um, so you, I'm assuming a student is only ever in a closed school once. Right, they don't move to a school and then have it. That's right. But you can't well, well, there's a couple of them, but very few. Okay, yeah. but are there lots of receiving people who receive? Them? Like, I'm just like, what about because you can be see? Yeah. How do you ha how would you handle that? So framework? right, good question. So if you are in a receiving, if you are in a school that receives once, let's say yeah. in 12, 13, but not 13, 14. Yeah. A cohort of kids displaced. I'm gonna right. So these are just gonna be dummies for that given year. So. But you have, yeah, but, so you'll have two vectors. No. That, right, right, so no, no, so I'll see, um, how did I handle this? So in terms of the fraction that I experienced, I took the mean fraction. So like if one year you got 5% displaced, the next year you got 10%, I gave you 7.5%, right? But this is going to be, right, right, so I'm, if I'm a kid in a receiving school this year, then I'm necessarily a receiving kid in each of the years yeah. forward and each of the years back. So, so if I'm ever a receiving kid, that those dummy variables on the T's, right? So so for example, if I get a kid in 12-13, yeah. right? And I also get a kid in 13-14, yeah. then I'm going to assign you the first year of your receiving. Okay, so you just decided based That's on the right. first year. That's right. Even though in in technically there's yeah no, I understand but this, you yeah. could also have you could have a superscript on this beta k by when you your closure or your receiving cohort effectively okay yeah yeah that, that question makes sense yeah yeah it yeah so again so so yes I agree with you Eric about the the levels are quite different but here's the trend again so these are the kids that never received a kid from closed schools here are kids that did, and your kids from the closed schools, right? And so again, here's this sort of pre-trend, trending similar. You see a little bit of a dip. I'm going to show you this estimated more directly in the regression framework. Not a significant dip in this in this year just prior to the closure, right? And what you'll also see is that in the post-closure period, the trend looks very similar between the kids from displaced school closures and the kids in the non-receiving schools. But you see this little bit of a dip in achievement for the kids in receiving schools that is significant, small in magnitude, about 0 0.02, 0 0.03 standard deviations. But again, I'll show you this more directly in the regression framework. So at least in that respect, it gives me some confidence that, yes, these kids look very different. But at least in terms of the validity of the, the dip and dip design, right, the trends, even in the shortened period of 9 3, that is a little bit of a concern. It would be nice to have more pre-years looks fairly similar, even with a little bit of a dip that, again, is not statistically different from zero. All right. And then similar pre-trends on the behavioral measure. So here I'm just summing all absences together. And again, you'll see this is the trend for kids from closed schools in the pre-period, receiving schools, non-receiving schools. So certainly the levels are quite different. But we see this very big increase in absences in the year after closings for our kids displaced compared to these kids from in non-receiving schools, and a bit of an uptick as well in the receiving schools. Not much happening on the suspensions. Some increase, though that increase I'll show you is not conditional on, um, or in the regression framework, not different from zero. Right. So here are those the pre-estimates that you're asking about here in these pre-periods, right? And so this is for displaced kids, math and ELA. Everything is relative to the base year, which is the year of closings, 
right, normalized to zero for both cohorts. And we see, again, no statistically significant effects in the pre-period, right? And again, those, those coefficients aren't different from, zero, from each other either in those, in those pre-periods. And then nothing happening, on average, in this post-period in terms of math really achieving for displaced kids. Right. But there is some important heterogeneity in those effects, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Now, in terms of the kids from receiving schools, we see a little bit of a different picture. Right? So again, in this pre-closure year, we don't see anything you know, different from zero. A little bit of a, you know, a difference in that second pre-receiving period. But again, those effects are not different from each other. And at least in terms of math, we see a pretty immediate shift downward. Again, on the order of about 0 0.02, 0 0.03 standard deviations that persists throughout the post period. In ELA, we see a little bit of a different pattern. We see, again, no effect in those first two years after receiving a kid, but a negative effect by the third year. Yeah? Could you uh, talk about the effects by, say, the students who are already there versus the new ones? So, yeah, so these are going to be the kids that were already there. This is for test code for the one. So yeah, so let me start. Yeah, so, so these are the kids that were displaced due to closings. No average effect in the post period. Right? Yeah, I know, I get that look a lot. No average effect. How is that possible? That's I, good. Right? I think it is good. Again, there's important heterogeneity that I'll talk about. But we see this sort of sh negative shock to math achievement for those kids that were already there, the receiving school kids. Nothing immediate in terms of ELA, but something sort of cumulative here, at least by the third year. Do you? So even though for those it's not significant in the pre-period, it still looks like there's kind of, you could sort of visualize a downward trend. Right, and I'm right. wondering if you sort of like yeah. could take that detrend, <laughs> like even though yeah. it's not significant, detrend it and see if there's still, still yeah. an effect. So Matt, this is a different paper, but I think it'd be kind of cool. Yeah. So it's the politigamy of who uh, actually was a receiver. Hmm. So I'd be very interested if schools were at, who were schools that were like 73, 74% um, free reduced price lunch. Yeah. Raise their hands and said, I'll take them. Mm. You get the a money. 75, you get title one. Right, for the money. Yeah, yeah. It's a good question. That's a lot of money on the table. Yeah. You just get a couple more poor kids. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I have, yeah, so obviously we know which schools they ended up in. But it does school. speak to the fact that they could yeah. get a, a significant financial shock. That's right. That's right. If they're open. But, but, but school wide title one is just 40% of free reduced yeah. price lunch, right? So 75. School-wide? It's 40%. 40. Is it 40%? Yeah. school -wide. Oh, then they're all. You're right, right. So they're already over the margin. But in terms of the, they're still getting an additional per pupil allocation if they get yeah. those kids. You're still talking about in Philadelphia, it's about thirteen or $14,000 per pupil. So it's not insignificant, uh, right? But David, it's a good point. It's something I have to sort of do some more work on in terms of, yes, these, or, these average effects are not different from each other. But is that a trend, or is that just idiosyncratic? Who yeah, knows? yeah. I, it's know, unfortunate. Yeah, I, I don't have more pre data, right? And the school district is not really willing yeah. to give me. I wonder if there's any just control. Sometimes, if you just put in control of their interactions, it can soak up. That yeah, one thing to do data. is, you know, I, I can put in just a uh, student specific wrong? time trend. What's that? Yeah, these wrong? That, that's good. No, no, these are regression adjusted. These so are what are your what are your controls? I'm sure I forgot. Yeah, so so these are just right. So here we've got student level. No, I know, but just what are they? So we've got oh, age, race, gender, um, free reduced price lunch, ELA, I, special ed status, and then you've got grade by year fixed effects, oh. all student fixed effects in there. Yeah. So I mean, one thing I could do. Do I have enough degrees of freedom? Probably to put in student specific time trends. Or school? Yeah. Could you do school specific time trends if you don't have enough for students? The problem is that the schools disappear out of closure. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But that's right. Yeah. But I agree with you. I mean, yeah. there's nothing really, you know, short yeah. of having more data to do about that thing. Yeah. Okay. So in terms of the average behavioral effects, right? So first we're looking at oh, and, and I agree with you. That's sort of what you might see here, right? Yeah. Like yes, it's not clear to me that. So this is just sort of just at the ninety-five percent sort of yeah, I'm straddling zero in terms of the number of suspension days with no real change. And again, here we're also just talking about 10% difference on a base of 0.93 days. So you're really talking at most 10% is nine days fewer two years prior to closure per 100 students, right? So again, 
in terms of magnitude, it doesn't seem to me like there's much going on in terms of the suspension days, even with this potential increase here. Although, again, I'm not, I, I'm not, you know, I can reject the null, right? rather, I can't reject the null that these things are different from each other, but I can't say anything about that, whether that's a trend or not. I wonder if it would be, you'd get cleaner trends if you tried estimating this just comparing um, the receiving students with the, not with the closed schools, but with the non-changing schools, because you don't need to put those closed students in there. I'm wondering if, even though, I know you control for that, but I'm wondering if somehow. So you, you want to compare the receiving, just take the closed school students out of that regression. But the estimate here is for those kids. Well, well for this one, you could do it with just the closed and the identified, uh, not changing, and right, right. the receiving. Right. Yeah. So I, yeah, I agree with you that that might. It's not um, quite clear what's going on here, but in terms of the absences, I think this story is pretty clear. Yeah. Right. That's very I mean, nice. I think, right. Yeah. You've got this like pretty significant shock on the order of twenty percent, which happens to be the same magnitude of what they found in the Zimmer and Engberg paper that persists for two years following closures, right? And so going here, we're talking about a 20% increase in, in absences over a base of about 18 days. So we're talking about you know, almost four additional days, which is not an insignificant share of additional absence days, which again, don't appear to manifest themselves in terms of achievement effects, um, but there are likely other effects that matter that at least I'm not estimating in this paper. And then we don't see much in terms of changes in outcomes both in terms of suspension days, modest increase by the third year after, and not much happening on the on the absence side for those receiving kids. Yes. So what's driving that negative change on receiving students in terms of high school? Negative change in receiving kids. Yeah, on the on the achievement side. Yeah. So what we're, what I'll see is when we look at this sort of concentration of displaced students, it's really driven by. Um, the composition of the kids that are displaced. In my effect, this is a, in my in my view, this is a pure effect story, right? This is a story of if I'm a really if I'm an average performing kid in a school that receives a lot of low performing kids, my achievement is going to suffer, right? And my behavior may it doesn't seem to be affected that much, but it's really about bringing in kids who, again, are a quarter of whom are proficient in math or ELA in the settings where 40 to 45 percent are proficient. Again, we're not talking about Highly proficient, but we're talking about you know almost twice as many of the, or half as many kids that are proficient that are entering into my schools. And if only one enters into my school, I'm not going to I'm not doing any worse. And I'll show you those effects right now. But I think it's really about a pure effect story in terms of bringing these really um, academically disadvantaged kids into settings that are not prepared because again the resources were not there. Right, the district didn't really do much to accommodate. Right. Um, and bring those kids into settings that we're not prepared to actually address the learning needs of those so could you additional kids. Address that a little bit. I, I like that a lot. But so you do everything with when you look at receiving. Yeah. You you focus, for example, on kids that were there. That's right? right. But this would be kind of interesting to know, like post once you get these new kids in, what happens to disruptions? What happens to suspensions? What happens to you know those kind of things? Do we see a more disruptive environment post? Well, so at least with respect to the kids that receive, we don't on their outcomes, suspensions and absences. I guess maybe I'm just confused, but what yeah. I'm asking is, is, but is this just, is this just the kids, are we only looking at the kids who were in those schools prior, or is this the whole, is this the average for all kids, including the new ones? All, the, these are all the kids that were in a school and then hear that they received at least one kid that was displaced. This would be the average effect for all those kids. Including the received one or not? No, this is, no not these are estimated separately for the received right. kids. Yeah. Right, and that's what, that's my this, question. This, right. effect, that's your question. this is so separately this estimated. Is this is what right, this is what I'm talking about. Yeah. So I think it'd be really interesting to see the impact overall in the receiving schools. Because I want to get an idea of, yeah. did, did we see greater yeah. disruption? Yeah. Regardless of what happened to the current kids, overall was a great yeah. disruption, which could have then even if they didn't have more absences, as you just said, right. greater disruption might have reduced their performance. And you're thinking disruption in terms of? Suspensions, absences, um, any measurable thing. I mean, yeah. Now, suspension's a hard one, but aren't there like more mild? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, what would be nice to have, which I don't so have, have they're they're not, more mild like some yeah, yeah, but they're not recorded. The suspension data is required by federal law. They uh, have to record it, but like detentions. Yeah, yeah like some other like demerit system would not be. I don't know. Maybe Philadelphia 
administrative data has that. Well, we have the suspensions. What's the other? Like a detention. You know, detention, like, yeah, I don't see detention. Yeah, they no, call them in-school suspensions, and those are terribly code. Like, the, the data is not consistent. Okay, and even 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 all. that is is, is yeah. more severe than the like more. Moderate. We have we have data on like physical violence, um, verbal verbal abuse. Yeah. So. Verbal one does not Yeah. I think you can actually um, address Nishi's question further, right? Because you do know what sort of treatment these receiving kids are getting, right? Right. So you know if the five, ten, or one kid that they're getting, what sort of what quality of mm -hmm. kids they are. I mean, the you, saw them, yeah. you saw them in, in, in the pre-moving year, so you can actually test whether having more of an extra percentage point of a kid that was uh, absent or disrupted, or so, the bottom part of the... Mm -hmm. right? yeah. so, you, you, you can so I'm just going to show, yeah, I think this is a good point. So I'm just going to show you the fraction that actually showed up. I think what you're adding, what you're suggesting, I think it's right, is adding some dimensionality to that, which is, what does that fraction mean? So 5% displaced kids means what in terms of additional suspensions from the prior year, for example? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. and do you have this like by gender? Sure. Okay. So, should I bring up the effects by gender? No. Okay. But I have data by gender. So, you, is there any difference? Oh, I didn't estimate the, the closure effect by gender separately. I mean, I could do that. But I, but I haven't done that yet. Yeah. 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 So let me. Yeah. So let me. So I think that this is to me obviously this gets into sort of compositional change, right? It's really trying to get a sense for whether you know schools that received one student versus 100 students had any meaningful difference on average in terms of these achievement or behavioral outcomes. And so I'm going to interact these sort of treatment indicators, these close and receiving by this percent displaced, right? So this is the fraction of students in a school who are displaced as of year T. So more specifically, only students whose school, who schools, for example, closed in 11-12 are counted as displaced in 12-13, right? They no longer count as displaced in 13-14. Kids who come from schools that were closed in 12-13 are counted as displaced in 13-14. So the effect, again, is going to be a function of and not causal, right, because again, percent displaced is endogenous, it's choice here, but on average, right, we'll, we're going to have the sort of average effect, right, scaled by the share of kids that are displaced um, in the receiving school following closure. Mac, well, I yeah. want to clarify my question. Yeah. So once these students are going to this new school or in the classroom, yeah. so it must be affecting the class size, right? Mm. I don't know what the rule is, what, 20 is to 1? It depends. There is a rule, but the rules are generally broken. Okay. I mean, especially in places like Philadelphia, and where there are class size caps, but typically those class size caps are not binding, simply because of resource issues. But that should issues. be uh, an additional way of having impact on the outcomes and the class size. Right, so if the class size goes up. And so, because I don't have the teacher data in this data, I can't generate a measure of student-teacher ratios. Um, but enrollment, I certainly know, right? But here the argument is that, you know, in a, you know as opposed to just class size, does the share of having more of these displaced kids play some role in changing changing outcomes? And the answer is yes. But first, in terms of the distribution of displaced kids attending uh, receiving school, so among all students in the post closure year, about three percent is the mean concentration of displaced students. Right now, certainly a conditional on being displaced, you're with about 16% of displaced kids. All right? But you can see that the, that the distribution is fairly wide here. So from very small to even close to 40% among those that were displaced. And again, the same thing where the density is sort of around 0 0.02, 0 0.03, or 3%. You know, Matt, just, yeah. you can get for every single one of these years the class size in all the schools from the F33 universe files, school level. You can get, can you get grade level counts? Yep. Yeah. So you can, can see class size yeah. for all these schools. That's right, well, CCD. Yeah. teacher ratios. Sorry. Right, that's the thing. The, 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 right, the teacher ratios are at the school or district level. School level. School level. So in the universe school files. That's right. But again, with the, with the teacher data that I'm hoping to to use for this paper, in the state, um, I could try to. Maybe some, yeah, yeah, I think so. They'll let me use it. So we'll see. But yes, 
I mean, that's, that's certainly the class size issue is an important one. I agree. Okay. So how do these achievement effects on average vary by the concentration of this? I'm sorry, I need to be. So yeah. Go back one. Yeah. The yeah. Next, one back more. Yeah. I'm just struggling here. So what I was thinking of is, so yeah, is, it, is that percent displaced the same in receiving and closed? No. Okay, so that depends. It's it called the same, but it's a different variable. That's right. Got it. No, well, it's the same variable, but it's going to vary in its value depending on the school that the so kid ends up. So percent displaced and receiving is how many you're taking in of those just displaced. Yeah. So if I have, right, so if in my enrollment, yeah, in this school, yeah. yeah. But for for a closed and displaced kid, Eric, in that same school, that will be the same value, right? So like if you were in the school, you're a receiving kid, I'm a displaced kid. We're in the same school in that year. That value, of the variable, will be the same for us. Does that make sense? So like if, if, if we're in the same school in 13, 14, you were, you're there, you were there before, so you're a receiving kid. I show up after my school closed. There's 10% of me. You also get 10%. Yeah. Okay. So the value is the same if we're in the same school yeah. year. Yeah. Yeah. So at least in terms of math, so this is uh, for the displaced kids, right? This is 25% displaced. So again, a quarter of the enrollment of the school in the year after closure are kids that were displaced due to closure, which is one standard deviation above the mean, which was 16%, and 7% is one standard deviation below the mean, right? Um, we see that there is this important variation that gets bigger in the average effect, right, after closure. So again, the main effect is zero. You saw, you've seen this already. But there is this important heterogeneity, which at least two years after closure is significantly different from zero. There is a difference, right, if I go from 7% concentration of displaced to 25%, right, my, on average, my math effect for displaced kids goes down. It's not different from zero in the first year, but significant by that second year, which is what we see here. The pattern is the same, but also in the second year for ELA, but we see it happening sort of immediately in ELA in that first year. Now, the question is why, right? So what may be driving the differences in achievement effects? It's not quite clear to me yet why, that, why we would see that. Maybe Shelby have some theory about why we might see increases in it's, the share. So it's just, what's your story for the fact that it's Converted. positive for the low end? Right, so for the low end kids. No, no, I'm looking at math. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So even for these guys right here, right, with only 7% displaced, which is yeah. one standard deviation below the mean. So I'm one of a few kids in a new school that has higher achieving peers, Right, more effective school value added, which I sort of skipped over, but these are more effective schools in terms of value added, right, with peers who have better behavioral outcomes. So I'm in, so, and there's just a couple of me. So I can, so I'm now in classes where most of my oh, so peers. These are, these are, you're showing me the ones for closure. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Displaced kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, but, right, so now I'm in schools yeah. where my yeah. peers are much better, and there's not a lot of me to maybe change the overall composition which is a very different story than if now there's a quarter of the students in the school that are like me, right, in terms of coming from more academically disadvantaged schools where we see that effect at least different from the effect where 7%, right, are displaced. And we see that opposite, so this is the story that you were just telling, right, among the receiving kids, Eric, right, which is that and the effects are much smaller in magnitude, but again, here we've got 10% displaced, that's one standard deviation above the mean among the displaced, of the receiving kids, and 1%, right, is one standard deviation below the mean. Now again, these effects are small, but at least in the first, second, even third years, the more kids I am in school with that were displaced, the worse on average I do, right, both in terms of math and ELA. So that's consistent with the story, right, that again, I'm receiving peers that are lower achieving, have more suspensions, have worse attendance and absence outcomes. Um, Pre-closure, there are more of them in my school. I do worse in terms of so, my math achievement. You know, Steve Ross just loves these pure stories, so he's not here because he's been sick. But you know, he would be asking you to do the following. I guarantee you this. Yeah. He'd be asking you, listen, what I really want to know is, I don't care about this place per se. What I care about is the number of kids that moved to your your receiving school. Yep. I want to know the number of kids that were in my school in my grade that moved to your school. So the idea being that uh, if you have a large, <laughs> large group of your real peers, so, so grade you never change peers, behavior just because you bring your peer group with you. Right, right. We're very, right? Yeah, yeah, Whereas about if that, you yeah. had kids from a different school that moved in, yeah. it might be very different. So he would love to see that. So, so school by grade level. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. 
So the question then becomes, it's your story still, the question is, because this would be a fascinating paper in of itself, is, is it really like if you bring your, your group with you, yeah. is that yeah. really what matters? Yeah. Right. Like you bring your group, you just go change your behavior. Right. You can't bring your group, you change your behavior. Yeah. No, that's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. It should be easily doable. No, it's doable. No, it's definitely doable. And I think what it suggests to me is that's probably what's happening. Because again, when I'll show you the distance traveled, these kids are not traveling much farther. So they're likely moving to the same schools. But I guess they choose their receiving schools. So you could, so I guess that's not necessarily exogenous. So it is right. It's not right. It's not right. Right. So it's still, the yeah. choice is not exogenous. It's still yeah. 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 But, yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with that. Right. I can't say that it's it this that's universe. causing it. Yeah. I'm saying that there's this interesting heterogeneity yeah. around this right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right. But you, you have the addresses, so you could actually go as far as probably Steve would suggest, is look at people who live more residentially proximate if they're more likely to move together, right? The movement decision is endogenous about which school to attend. Yeah, so you could use the distance. Well, whether it's, right, right, whether there's coordination yeah, and people who live on the yeah, same block, yeah. for instance. Yeah. You can see that this one paper can quickly become yeah. higher. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I've been fighting the whole thing. Okay. So in terms of uh, these behavioral effects, again, just for displaced students, we don't see much until, at least in terms of suspension days, until the third year after. So one, the story could be, look, you know, if there's more of me, or types like me, right, in schools where there are 25% displaced in that first year, and then there's some cumulative negative sort of association over time in terms of the student suspension days, but the effect is sort of immediate in terms of absences, right? Again, if I'm entering a school as a displaced kid with many more peers like me, my, on average, my attendance is about 30% you know, increase in absence days relative to kids who um, have far fewer kids like me the year after closure. Now, in terms of the kids um, that are in the receiving schools, we see some, not much on the on suspensions, right? By the third year, maybe some difference, about 2%. So again, we're not talking about big magnitudes here and then some heterogeneity in terms of the absences, right? So again, on average, when more kids are displaced in my school, right, where the concentration is greater, right, my absences on average are also greater, right? Now, what about in terms of the change in school quality? So here I'm going to introduce this, this measure of change in performance, right? So this change in performance is take the percent proficient from the 2000 five, six, to the 2010, 11 years, right? So these are all pre-closure years. At the school level, and I just take the average of that, right, for both math and ELA. So this gives me this sort of average percent of students that are proficient over the, this pre-closure period. And I'm going to do that for the school that I was in post-closure, and I'll do that for the school that I was in pre-closure, and the difference is what I'm calling changing performance, all right? So you might say, well, why don't you use some sort of value-added measure? Well, the first concern, the first issue is that I don't have the data to go back that far to do it. The other thing, the other thing to consider, right, is that unlike VAM estimates of either school inputs or school effectiveness or teacher effectiveness, right, they're not removing the influence. These proficiency rates don't in remove the influence of these school quality inputs, that peer effects or teacher quality that likely impact the students' academic and behavioral outcomes. Right, so to some extent, these proficiency rates incorporate those measures that we wouldn't necessarily want to purge them of to try to generate a measure of changing overall school quality. All right. So again, we're going to have this interaction which is going to give us the sort of on average change as we change the performance of the school that the student is in. And so first, here's the distribution of that change in school performance. Here's math and ELA. And in terms of math, we see about three quarters of the kids are in better performing schools by about seven percent and about 70% of kids on ELA are in, in schools um, with better ELA proficiency by about 5 percentage points. But quite a bit of heterogeneity here, right, in terms of the variance in those measures. It still looks like the mass of kids on either measure are getting better schools. That's right. Well, yes. So only about, right, so 73%, 72% are in better right. schools in math, and about 70, exactly. Exactly. So that's good news in terms of are they going to schools on average that we would consider you know, at least serving higher performing kids and having yeah. some effect on them. So what we see is that in terms of math, we don't see much, which is interesting, right? So the second year, there's a little bit of a difference. It's not different from zero. 
but we see all the action really happening on the ELA side. And I've actually estimated you know, the effect of changing the ELA performance on math and the effect of changing the math performance on ELA. These are showing going to school, interacting the change in math prof proficiency on math achievement and the change in ELA proficiency. And again, what we see is that if I go to a school that's one standard deviation higher on average than the average change in, pro in proficiency, I'm doing much better than kids that go to, on average, lower performing schools, and that persists at least for two years after the school is closed. Right? So consistent with some prior evidence that if I go to a better school on average, do I on average do better? Now again, it's not a causal story, right? Because it's not the, the school quality that's causing this change, because again, there's, there is choice about where kids end up, but it does suggest that the average effects of zero, there's some meaningful and important variation that is correlated with going to a better performing school. And then what about distance to school? So here I'm going to generate this change in distance measure. And I didn't show the, sorry, I didn't show the behavioral effects by change in school performance because there are none. Right? So really where we're going to see the behavioral effects that, that function as a, or that change as a function of um, uh, some moderating variable is going to be on this distance measure. Okay? And so what I'm going to do is this delta distance is literally the difference between how far I traveled in miles to my school in the year of closure. Right? And then subtracting that from how far I traveled in the, to my new school after closure. Okay. So here is the, the distribution. This is for all displaced kids. So this is just all grades. Here this is going to be our analytic sample, grades 3 through 8. And so what you'll see is that this incorporates 9th through 12th grade kids. And you'll see these kids are traveling farther relative to the kids in grades 3 through 8. But the point is that these kids are traveling less than a tenth of a mile on average to their new school. Now there is some variation, right, about a, a little over a mile on average in terms of the, the, this, this, the variance here. But again, these kids are traveling to schools that are generally in their neighborhoods, right? Again, given that map where we saw all these schools sort of bunched up together. You know, kids in North Philly, Sean, are not going to South Philly, especially in the elementary grades. Yeah. yeah. And so what we find is that, at least with respect to suspensions, and again, these are for displaced kids only, Kids that are traveling one mile farther than, they, than the mean change, which again is about 0 .10, 0 .06, right, 0 .10, on average they have about, what is that, about 6% increase in the number of suspension days compared to zero for kids that actually travel less distance after closures. And that's significant in, in the first two years. And then again, we see this big, this, this significant difference. If I'm traveling farther, right, I'm actually I have more absence. That makes sense. And someone might say, well, what about the suspension days? Now, in Philadelphia, if you're tardy to school, and Philadelphia has changed its discipline policy around suspensions, and I've done some, a lot of work on this as well, but if you're tardy consecutive days or multiple days, you can be suspended for that, which, again, sounds insane, right? Like you're going to suspend someone for being late to school or absent. But it happens, and it happens a lot, especially in places like Philadelphia. But again, you know, I don't know. I can observe the mechanism by which these suspensions differences in suspensions are happening, but you know, certainly you, know, you can imagine that these are kids that now have to travel a mile farther. Well, on average, the additional distance was less than about a tenth of a mile, right? and they might be late, or for a variety of other reasons, um, and you see a, a significant difference in suspension days, same thing on absences. Suspension also depends on the receiving school's policy, right? So it's not really comparable how many, like your so, own increase in suspension. No, it's a good question. So, the, so it actually is a district-wide um, discipline policy. So every traditional public school in Philadelphia is subject to the same, not charter, but traditional public school in Philadelphia, like most districts, is um, subject to the same discipline code of conduct. So in principle, how it in, it's implemented is totally different. And I can tell you that from other work that I've done, which has looked at changes in suspension policy, where schools that serve very different populations of kids within the district implement policy reforms around suspension use very differently. So I agree with you. Um, but again, we're comparing the same, you know, we've got, there are, the, it, so let me, let, me, let me say this. I think part of the, ch the chain could also be a function of the different norms in those schools. So I think to your point, if I'm going to a school that is stricter around tardiness, I might see an increase in my suspensions. Mm -hmm. If it's stricter around um, profanity, right, which is actually a policy, which is an infraction that it should not be subject to suspensions in Philadelphia in this time period, I could be 
you know, subject to more suspension days. Whatever the case might be, right, it's notable that, again, if we're imposing these sort of additional travel burdens, and again, by choice, because again, this is, the distance to school is a choice variable to some extent, right? Um, but again, it's not a, you know, a mile in Philadelphia is like basically 10 blocks, which is most kids walk, right? So um, it is a bit of concern that if there are some kids that are choosing to go a little bit farther to their schools, on average, they may be experiencing more suspension days. Okay, just to sort of summarize, I don't know how we're almost done, probably. Four or five, we okay. So displaced students, at least descriptively, enroll in higher performing schools, both in terms of student and peer achievement and behavioral outcomes following school closings. On average, the closures had no effect on the achievement of displaced students, but we do see some important heterogeneity, such that achievement seems to be increasing on average in the positive increase, or the, the, the increase in, in school performance, but decreasing right, in the fraction of, or concentration of displaced kids in the receiving school. We see that closures increase those displaced students' absences, or again, on average, those absences are increasing in the concentration of displaced students and also this additional distance travel to schools. And then there's some evidence of a negative spillover under the achievement of their receiving school peers. I'll hold off on the policy implications for now and just sort of open them up and talk about questions. So thanks to everyone for your attendance and questions. I appreciate it.